Malachi 2, uh, 17 is where we are starting here today. We left off at Malachi 2, 16, and so we are going to jump right into the very next verse for God's word tonight. Malachi 2, 17 says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Let's pause there. What's happening here? Remember, Malachi is, is a wake-up call to the Israelites. Return to me, says the Lord. Israel has returned from captivity and bondage, but they haven't returned to the God who has returned them. They've built the wall. They've built the temple. They've built their homes. They've re reestablished their markets. They've reset worship in the temple. They've started trade again. They have peace. They've restored worship. But they haven't returned to the God of all of these things. Their actions have exposed time and time again their hearts. They've been going through the motions. La-di-da, following the Lord. Just a la-di-da following him. Thus far in Malachi, we've seen the Lord speaking to them. I love you. I chose you. Yet, you despise my temple. You've turned against me with, and you've turned against your wives. You've had this great and privileged position and you've polluted it. Where's my honor? I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts. Who do you think you are? Who do you think I am? Verse 17, we find the people still not happy. Why are they not happy? Well, verse 17 tells us. Because they're seeing wicked people get ahead. What gives, God? What's going on here, God? Don't you see this? I guess, I guess you don't care. Don't, don't you see? She's a gossip and a slanderer. And her, and her kids never get sick. Uh, 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 this guy right here, he, he worships a God from Persia. And his house looks like it's getting blessed. This, this guy over here is a scammer. And, and all he's doing is he's scamming and scamming. And he's got a boat out of it. Uh, these folks are oppressing the poor. They're cheating people out of their money they deserve. They're, they're sleeping around on their wives. They're blasting out lies. They're getting ahead. I guess, I guess, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them. Well, he must. Because why are they getting ahead? Where's the God of justice? Doesn't he see? Doesn't he care? Why follow him? Either God is not good, or God is not powerful to stop this. Look at the evil. Where's God? You, you can imagine them saying today, right? Why is it that there's so many wars that have displaced millions of people? And those warlords, they just seem to get ahead. Why is it that despicable people are elected to high offices and they give it so much power? Why is it that the greedy, the selfish, the arrogant find themselves flying through life just so effortlessly? Why is it that the poor find no relief and the proud have no limit to their resources? Why is it that the hungry go without food and the glutton pulls up to the buffet again? Why is it that an eight-year-old girl can die in an explosion while a wicked 80-year-old sit at his beach house with his fourth wife? Where's the justice? Where's the justice, God? Maybe it's true. That everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them. He must. Because why are they getting ahead? I guess God doesn't care. God can't stop it. Moments of honesty lead us to places like this, don't they? If, we aren't, if we're honest with ourselves, we drive in the, why, why, why is it so easy for them? Why is it so hard for me? Why is it so easy and so hard for me? But 
moments of honesty, being honest with ourselves, don't necessarily lead us to the most truthful places. The Lord tells his people in response to this, through Malachi, that he is weary of these accusations. He's wearied. He's not physically tired. God doesn't do that. But he's just sick of the accusations. He's sick of the questions that are coming to him, and he's sick of the heart that's spurting forth the question. You have wearied the Lord with your words, says verse 17. You've literally caused the Lord to be exhausted with you. This is, in the army, there's a term for this. It's called withering fire. It's lots and lots and lots of bullets coming your way. The Lord is weary of their words. Just time out, though, for a second. Something isn't, isn't really jiving. Doesn't, doesn't the Lord want to hear from us? Doesn't the Lord love to hear from us and to hear us call out to him in, our, in the middle of our confusion? Isn't he the one who's telling us to ask and to seek and to knock? Isn't he the one who wants to hear from me? Listen, loved ones, it's true. That's true. God never, ever, ever grows weary of a heart that calls out to him, that asks, that seeks, that knocks. Call to me, he says, I will answer you. The Lord never grows tired of this heart. So what's happening here? What's happening in this passage that's different from this? Well, what's happening is Malachi sees, what's happening is Malachi calls, out, calls them out on is they're calling out the, the confusion of who God is. They're saying completely false things about who God is. I guess God must like evil. You see how horrible this is? I guess God must like evil. They know that's not true. There's a sarcastic tone to this. They know the opposite is true. What's going on in this passage is the Israelites crying out to God, not honestly, Lord, what's going on, but accusing God. They weren't asking him. They were accusing him. The difference is tone, right? You have kids, some of you. Even if you don't, you can fill in the blank. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. There's a difference between saying, what are you going to make us for dinner? And what are you going to make us for dinner? It's the difference between, oh, you're going to wear that? And, oh, you're going to wear that? The tone is off. It's not asking the Israelites. The Israelites are asking, they're accusing God. Where is, the ju- where is the God of justice? Just look at the mess. Where is the God of justice? I guess he's not here. I guess he's not coming. We asked. We sought him. We knocked. He's not answering. He doesn't care. You have wearied the Lord with your words. What we're going to look at in the rest of this passage is how God answers the accusation. And what we're going to see is while the people accuse him, God's going to be the one who actually acts. And the truth for us all this evening as we gather together is this, justice is coming. Justice is coming. They're asking for the God of justice. Get ready, Israel, because here he comes. And look at verse 3 One with me. And by the way, aren't you glad that our God is the God who walks the talk? He doesn't just sit back and say, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this and posture. He's the one who says, I'm gonna do it, and then he actually does it. Justice is coming. Look at verse three, verse one, chapter three, verse one. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. Here's the first point for our sermon tonight. It's this, justice is coming, justice is coming, and he's gonna purify. He's gonna purify. Justice has a name, and he's coming, and he's going to purify. The Lord answers the people by declaring in this passage that we just read that he's gonna send two specific people that are gonna come. Two specific people, guaranteed, says the Lord, you can accuse me, I'm gonna act, guaranteed, guaranteed, 
These guys are coming. Look at first, look at 3 1 again. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, that word for that phrase, my messenger, in the Hebrew, you want to learn some Hebrew tonight? It's this Malachi. Malachi. I will send Malachi, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, what's fascinating, back then there was some discussion about who this Malachi was. This is not the writer of the book. Uh, but, but, and, and, and even now it's fascinating that there's some discussion about who this guy is. People are like, I wonder who the, my messenger is in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I, it could be this guy. It could be this guy. I wonder who it is. I think it's fascinating. Do you know why I think it's fascinating? Why do I think it's fascinating? Well, because Jesus in Matthew 11 comes right out and says who it is. You wonder who this guy is? Here he is. Matthew, Matthew 11. And as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. Who's that John? That's John the Baptist. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Were you out looking at plants? What did, then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. Did you go out for a fashion show? No, well, what then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send Malachi before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Who is this man? This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So, 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 so if you've got any confusion about this, how many of us think that when Jesus reads the Bible, he understands it perfectly? I think so too. I think that Jesus' interpretation is right. The whole world can interpret the text this way, and then Jesus comes along into the room and says, you know what, I think this is the way it needs to be. I think you and I need to be coming over to this side. And so Jesus reads this, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. He lives in the text, and he says, you know what? Malachi, that's John the Baptist. Case solved. Thank you, Jesus. Mystery over. It's John the Baptist. Who is this guy? John the Baptist. Here's one of my favorite pictures of John the Baptist. It's in the Jesus Storybook Bible. John the Baptist, of course, had the beard. There's another picture of him in the Jesus Storybook Bible where he's eating locusts dipped in honey. It's wonderful. The uh, image behind John the Baptist, uh, I'm going to send my messenger, says Malachi, and he's going to prepare the way before me. He sets the stage. He gets things ready. Now, what I want you to do is with Malachi open, I want you to take your pages and flip one, two, three with me. Three in my Bible, okay? That should walk you probably, unless you have a study Bible, that walks you right into Matthew. And by the way, while you're flipping those three pages, you're turning 400 years ahead in history. And let's look at this man who prepares the way. Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what's he preaching? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look down at verse uh, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for the baptism, uh, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not say, presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Talk about a crowd warm-up. That's the man who comes in and he prepares the way. What's he speaking about? He's not speaking about actions. He's speaking about attitudes of the heart. We can go back to Malachi now. What kind of preparation is this man doing? It's a preparation of the heart. Now, Malachi is going to spend more time at the end of his letter speaking about this messenger who's going to come. So let's not go any further on that. Uh, let's look at verse 1 still. Behold, I send my messenger, Malachi, John the Baptist, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi writes, and he says, you're looking for the God of justice, right? You're looking for the God of justice? You're asking if he's around, right? Well, he's coming too. The one you're looking for, he's on his way. Did you see the messengers in the text, verse 1? There will be a messenger who comes to prepare the hearts, the first guy who comes, and then suddenly, all at once, surprisingly, comes the second messenger, the messenger of the covenant. Where is the God of justice? He's on his way. But, but, 
the way he comes, the manner in which he comes, is not necessarily the way we would expect. Look at verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? Remember, we're not talking about Malachi. We're not talking about John the Baptist anymore. We're talking about the second messenger. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Okay, so messenger number one was John the Baptist. The question that some of you have already answered is, who's the second guy? Who's messenger number two? Well, here's some clues that we have from the text. Uh, his way is prepared for by John the Baptist. So some messenger's coming that will be prepared, his way will be prepared by John the Baptist. Second, his presence causes people to not be able to stand. No one can stand, no one can endure. It's almost like every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It's almost like catching the guy in a garden and asking him, who are you? And he says, who are you looking for? And he says, I am he. And then the people fall down. It's almost like that. It's exactly like that. How about this? His hands cleanse and purify by the actions of his hands. He purifies and cleanses. He's going to put hands on people and cleanse them. He's going to touch them and clean them. With his actions, he's going to purify them. And then his actions result in pure worship to God. Because of his work, purity of worship rises to God for the first time. Since the days of old, it says. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? It's none other than the Messiah. This is Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ comes. He is the one who has his way prepared for by John the Baptist. So here we have in Malachi prophecy about Jesus coming. He's going to be the one who comes. Where is the God of justice? They call out. Where is the God of justice? They say. 400 years before he arrives. Where is the God of justice? And Malachi responds, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Justice is coming. And he's going to purify. He's going to come and he's going to purify. Now think about this for a second. Just, just put yourself in the, in, the, in the hearers of Malachi. As they hear this word that he delivers to them, put yourself in their shoes for a second. Okay, we're asking for justice. We look to the left, we look to the right. There's injustice, 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 injustice. We see cheating, we see robbing, we see murder, we see financial instability. We see death, we see disease, we see famine. Where's the God of justice? Look at all the evil around us. Where's the God of justice? And then Malachi writes you and says, he's coming. He will appear suddenly in his temple. He's coming. Then what are you going to hear? He's like, yeah. He is on his way. Think for a second. You're on the playground, okay? And you're being bullied. You have to be a bit younger than you are now. Probably no one's going to bully you as an adult. It could happen, but I guess maybe not. Anyways, tangent. Uh, you're on the playground, okay? As a kid again, being pushed around and bullied. And then someone taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, there's your brother coming. And your brother isn't like, you know, shaped like me. Your brother actually is big. You know, it looks like he's wearing his, his Team Ninja t-shirt. And, and, and he's walking in with, with, you know, muscles that are, you know, on top of muscles. And he's coming in. And you know what you're thinking? Oh, yeah. You're going to get it. Here comes Justice. My big brother is coming. Here he comes. Now you're going to pay. Justice is coming. Oh, man, here he comes. Now you're in a world of hurt. Now you would expect that, right? You would expect that the, the people of Israel are expecting that too, right? They're expecting this. They're expecting that justice would be coming instantly. Laser beam from the sky. Light. Where's the God of justice? Here he is. Boom. Justice served. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm looking for. That's what we're looking for most times, aren't we? Right away, right away, God, do it. Right away. 400 years later, 
when Jesus steps into the scene, Israel's thinking the same thing. They're under oppression by Roman rule. They're being told to do things and act in certain ways that are completely against their beliefs and completely against what the, what the law code says. We can't do this. We can't behave in that way. We can't eat that. You can't make us do this. We're getting so sick of Rome. We want justice immediately. Where's the God of justice? Laser beam from the sky, God. They wanted justice meted out immediately. But that's not how the God of justice comes. Look again at verse 2. For he comes... For he comes, and, and who will stand in the day of his coming? For he is like a refiner's fire. Okay, okay, we're getting close. Fire, all right, here we go. Lightning bolt coming. And like fuller's soap. Uh, okay, soap, all right. Uh, are you gonna choke him with the soap? Okay, yes, soap. Okay, soap, fire, yes. And he will sit like a refiner and a purifier of silver. Pur purifier? Purify? Purify, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. What? Levi? Levi, the inner religious circle? Like we're talking the pastors and the leaders? What are you, what are you gonna do with the priests? Justice with them? What about those guys? Remember, we're telling you about those guys? The guys that, that are right there, the, the ones that are cheating, the ones that are robbing, the ones that are sleeping around, the ones that are doing all that stuff. They're living like they're just getting away with it. We wanted justice for them, not, not us. Why are you coming to us? What's going on here? Refining. Refining, remember refining? That's the process of heating something up and separating impurities from purities. Lots and lots and lots of heat. Fuller's soap, that's laundry detergent. It's the process of cleaning with a lot of work. Elbow grease, getting rough with it. Working on it. You know, our modern uh, laundry, we don't, we don't realize how hard it is. This is how hard laundry is now. Push a button, throw a soap thing in. You don't even have to pour it anymore. Just throw it in, <laughs> close the door, and walk away. You would think it was hard, right? The, the frequency with which it's moved around and it just sits there. You would think it'd be hard, but it's not. And the only, like, like, it's not too long ago, you had to work really hard to get your clothes clean. Did you know that in, in the modern, modern machine, washing machines, what are they called? Those things that clean your clothes? There's, some, there's a part in there, it looks like this. Have you seen this part? Do you know what that is? It looks like a Darth Vader mask upside down. What is that? It's agitator. It's an agitator. That doesn't sound like a friendly part. An agitator. You know what an agitator does? You can't know what it does because you can't lift the lid because it locks. But it, it moves back and forth and like really beats on your clothes. Like there's that, that wonderful blouse that you love so much, it's getting hammered by that thing. And the favorite pair of jeans, man, it's just wrecking them. That's what an agitator does. I could pull up a refinery and show you what that does too, but you know, you, you get, you're picking up, right? Lots of work, lots of pressure, hitting it hard, fire and soap, agitating purifies, difficulty cleanses. You're calling for justice, says the Lord. Well, he's coming. And he's coming to purify you. Me. What about those guys? What about those guys? Loved ones, this is why you're here tonight. Not to hear a message about somebody else. To hear a message about you. And what God wants to say to you tonight. We've been too busy, haven't we? We, we do this, I do this. Calling out for justice like this. God, that's an injustice against me. That's an injustice against me. That person has just committed this violation of trust and honor against me by cutting in front of me in the Tim Hortons line. <laughs> Justice has not happened here. 
We get so lost, don't we, on the horizontal justice. You've done this against me. I've done, uh, you've wronged me. You've wronged horizontal justice is what we're thinking about. That's what the Israelites are thinking about too. And God answers, yeah, I'll, come just, I'll bring justice. I'm not going to come like a, like, a, like a big brother on the playground, though. No. I'm coming like a father who loves you. And I'm speaking directly to you. You see, the justice that needs to be addressed before this can be addressed is this one right here with you and I. He comes. We failed, to say, we failed to see this, haven't we? We failed to see that the one who suffers the greatest injustice is the God of justice. We failed to see that in our sin, the one we're sinning against most grievously is not the person next to us, it's God himself. As David said in Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned. Well, you can look at the sense of justice in Psalm 51 and how it comes about. It's, the, it's right after David is confronted by Nathan and he slept around with Bathsheba. He's committed an injustice against her for sure. He's also murdered Uriah the Hittite. That's an injustice for sure. He's also committed a sin against the people of, of Israel. That's injustice for sure. Those are all horizontal injustices. But what David realizes and what you and I need to realize is that the greatest injustice is against God. Listen to this quote. What makes sin, sin, what makes sin, sin, what makes it so profoundly heinous, what makes it so deeply repugnant and culpable is that it's an offense against God. And then this quote, at, its, at the most profound level, whenever we sin, God is always the most offended party. God is always the one who's wronged the highest. In every sin, no matter how big or how little you think it is, the greatest offense sits against God. You want justice, says the Lord? He's coming. He's coming to purify you. And listen, fuller's soap and refiner's fire, that's not comfortable stuff. But I want you clean. Listen, it could be painful. It could mean trial. It could mean loss. It could mean tears. And our response to those loss, trial, pain, tears is saying, God, you're not good. Don't you see, the, don't you see how hard it is? You're not good. Or, or, or God, you're not strong enough to stop it. But God says to you, no, 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 no. There's the third option, and this one's the truth. That this fire, that this soap has been planned for you. It's been planned for you, not to punish you, but to bless you. No, because the fire doesn't consume you, son. And the soap doesn't wash you away, daughter. It's rough. It's painful. But it purifies and it cleanses you. J.F. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, he wrote this beautiful statement. Still he blesses those on whom he sets his love in a way that humbles them so that all the glory may be his alone. Still he hates the sin of, of his people and uses all kinds of inward and outward pains and griefs to wean their hearts from compromise and disobedience. Watch the last one. It's a long quote. Watch the last quote. Still he seeks the fellowship of his people and sends them both sorrows and joys in order to detach their love from other things and attach it to himself. I'll send you joy. I'll send you sorrow. I'll send you grief. I'll send you delight to detach your hands from the things of the world that will only leave you empty and to reattach your hands to the God of all faithfulness. Understanding this, then we can understand why James says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face various trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance, let it have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We get why James writes that. We get why Peter writes this. And this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, 
may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. We get why James says that. We get why Peter says this. We get why Paul says this now. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. The God of justice is refining. The Lord is cleansing. He sends them both sorrows and joys in order to detach their love from other things and attach it to himself. God sends trials sometimes to refine you and purify you. Now, in a room this size, there's many, many trials out there. And the Lord says to you today, my child, I love you. I may have sent that to you to grow you in your love for me so that you would see that this thing, this, this thing called life on this earth is only temporary so that you could see that the greatest trial that you have will only last maybe 80 years so that you will see that I am greater, far greater, so that you can see that this light, momentary affliction will prepare for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. God sends trials. God sends difficulties to refine and to cleanse us. That's the message Malachi writes to his people. That's true. That's true. But here's where the hope of the gospel is so beautiful, so beautiful. Yes, it's true. Just as we, it's, it's definitely true and that, that, that the, the one who suffers the greatest injustices in all of our sin is God himself. That's true. Yes, that's true. And, and, and so God will bring and send trials to refine us and to purify us uh, through difficulty. That's true, but you know what else is also true? Just as God is the greatest, the greatest, inju- suffered the greatest injustice in our sin, God also suffers the most because of it. He's the one who suffered the most in the injustice. He's the one who also will suffer the greatest. Not you or not I. In fact, the record of this book, the record of this book testifies to the only God who's ever spoken of or you could ever hear of that actually suffers as a part of his creation. No other world religion has an answer that satisfies like this. Everyone has to answer the question, why is there pain? Why is there hurt? Why is there difficulty? And the answer of Christianity, the answer that satisfies is, is, yes, there is pain and difficulty and hurt, but you know what? Our God is not removed from that. Our God is the one who walked into that. Our God is the one who suffered greater than anyone suffered. He's the one who understands what it's like. He willingly entered in to save us from our sins. This God who loves you so much that he would purify you through trials, he walked into time and space. He walked in and he became unclean so that you and I could be clean. He would wash you clean and you and I would walk free while he is clothed in the dirt of my sin. He brings forth from us offerings of righteousness while he becomes a curse on the cross. The God of justice loves you this much. He chose this path. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what pain is like. He knows what death is like. He could have judged. He could have judged. Lightning bolts. But he didn't. Instead he came. Instead he came. He gave his life for us that we might have freedom from this sin. He chose to suffer. He chose to die and to begin a new work in us. And because he became like us, now we can become like him. That by faith we lay hold, by faith we lay hold and we are freed. And notice the end of verse three. As a result of this, this messenger, he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Verse four, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. This, loved ones, is sometimes why pain comes and sometimes why pain won't leave. This is why it hurts. 
This is why it hurts sometimes. Justice is coming and he's, he's going to purify. Justice is coming and he's going to purify. But evil can't be allowed to exist indefinitely. And here's the great news at the end. God is just and merciful and just in judgment. Here's the second point. It's this. Justice is coming and he's going to judge. Justice is coming and he's going to judge. After verses 3 and 4, after the second messenger appears, verse 5, then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. This last verse, verse 5, serves as a, as a warning and it serves as an encouragement for those of us in Christ. A warning and encouragement. First, the warning. My actions are seen. He sees. My sin is never, never ignored. It's not misplaced. My injustices are there before God. As a righteous God, he knows them all. He sees the sorcerer, the adulterer, those who lie, those who oppress, those who thrust aside the sojourner. God sees them all. And notice, what's the, what's the root of all of these? What's the root of all of these sins that are listed here? It's the lack of the fear of God. With no fear of God, the people behave in this way. I will judge, says the Lord. I will judge swiftly. First, my people, I purify them. And then I come and I judge. Paul understands this when he writes hundreds of years later. He writes this in, in Galatians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You sow to the flesh, you sow to sin, you reap destruction. You reap death. You will reap what you sow, says the Lord. Do you think that you can escape this? Do you think that you can escape me? This is a warning, and with the warning, we've got two options. I can either surrender it to the one who would purify and cleanse. I can surrender my sins to Jesus Christ and in repentance turn away from this and find life and hope and joy in him. Or I can cling to my sins and suffer the consequence. The text is a warning for sure, but it, it's also a major, major encouragement for us. For us in Christ Jesus, sin is going to be judged this horizontal is going to get taken care of. God will redeem your suffering. This light momentary affliction prepares for us. This eternal glory in Christ that awaits us. It, 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 when this comes, it's going to make this life feel like a night in a bad hotel room. When that comes... The, the eternal weight of glory, this is just going to feel like a bad night on a bad bed in a bad hotel room. And the awesome reality for the believer in Jesus Christ, the awesome reality is there will be no judgment for us. Our judgment day is come and gone in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you and I will stand before the Lord and we'll give an account for our lives. But when that file is opened, when that file is opened and the record of your life is put before, that will be stamped on every page in blood red ink, this one is mine. I paid the price for this one, forgiven and freed with the initials JC. Freed in Christ. That's the reality for us. This day is going to end. He is going to come. And then, and then we'll hear the wonderful words Come, child, enter into the joy of my presence. And there in the joy of his presence, the Lord wipes away every tear. And sin and death are no more. And crying is no more, and mourning is no more, and pain is no more, and the former things have passed away. And then we hear the voice from the one who's seated on the throne. Behold, I am making all things new. Justice is coming. And Jesus adds, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. But are you ready for him? Are you ready for him to come?
Are you ready? What if he came now? What if this night your life was demanded of you? Would you be ready? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The Lord extends to you the free gift of salvation, even tonight. In me, he says, you can find sins forgiven. In me is not the easy life, but in me is the life of blessing and forgiveness and joy and hope and eternity with me. Are you ready? Ready?